Welcome to Wellness Radio with Dr. Jeanette Gallagher as your host. Her show discusses topics of health, wellness, and spirituality and is about discovering your place in this great universe from your cells to the cosmos. Along with her guest in casual conversation, she strives to ask the difficult questions that may be holding you back from a vibrant life and shares new ideas that may inspire you to make a change in your life that you only can see in your dreams. And now, here is Dr. Jeanette Gallagher. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Wellness Radio. This is Dr. Jeanette Gallagher, and it's a pleasure to have you with us here this evening. Tonight, we are going to be talking about the concept of love. What is it about? Perhaps the concept of marriage. Is it a joy? Is it a pleasure? Is it a game? Is it a puzzle? Is it perhaps a challenge? Many people are saying, I really don't even understand all of that. I'm going to sit over here and I'm going to just live my life out, nice, quiet, and peaceful. I don't need to engage in all of that other mechanistic kind of things or the work in progress or how to figure out humans. Still others say, I want to dance in the human pool. I want to be able to see what's going on. I want to touch and feel emotions, activities, growing, learning, expanding, and I want to find out everything I possibly can from this life. Truly what we'll be talking about today is everything in between those two extremes. How can we exist, coexist, expand, and be able to live this life with eyes wide open, heart open, and perhaps be seeing how we can actually heal and nourish each other in the process we are in. As we see in the year 2022, there's been so many hits recently. People are saying, I've got a broken heart. I don't want to do this anymore. I give up. I quit. I don't know the rules of the game, and I'm no longer wishing to stay in that which I've chosen before. Many people are saying, I stepped away from my partner. I stepped away from my marriage. I just decided, oh, this, I can, it's good to go on my own. Whereas others are saying, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to listen to someone else. I'm going to pay attention. I'm going to be present. I'm going to be honest, respectful, and carry trust at all times and see what my outcome is. Really what we'll be talking about today is how can you find love? How can you engage in a marriage? And how can you live your life co-piloting? With another. Today, my guests are John David Mann and Anna Gabriel Mann. The book is The Go Giver Marriage A Little Story About the Five Secrets to Lasting Love. John and Anna, thank you so much for joining us today. We're such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, you know, as uh, as always, when I touch and I uh, check into these Go Giver books, uh, it takes us on an adventure, an exploration, mm-hmm. and it really is. Um, it's always a delight because it's not uh, you're doing this wrong, you're doing that wrong. Bring it up, and then I've got the solution. Really, what the book is about, the Go Giver Marriage, is how can we take from where we are and blossom forward. Everything is positive, inspirational, and being able to nourish our sense of where we are. Yes? (laughs) Beautifully said. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. (laughs) It's about solutions, not about digging into the problems. You know, I think sometimes people say, well, I want to excavate, find out what's wrong. There's got to be something wrong with me. I think that's our old ways. That's the old way we used to navigate this human vehicle, you know, I would say pre-2020. I just don't need to do that anymore. You know, the whole idea, uh, John and Anna, is, you know, you used to go to a therapist, you sit there for years, you know, lay on the couch and spill it all out. And you get down to 10 years and you say, nothing really happened, nothing's really changed. Boy, what a waste of money. Do you think sometimes (laughs) that people will say, are we stepping into a new way of looking at where we are in life? I would certainly say so. I spent my early career as a therapist and um, spent a lot of years um, working directly with couples and working, doing not only couples therapy individually, 
with couples, but also in group couple therapy. Um, so I was blessed to have a very gifted um, trainer who was trained by Dr. John Gottman and who had quite an impressive background in understanding the dynamics of what makes marriages go south and really, you know, take a turn for the worst. But I also found that, you know, if both people in the room are not participating and wanting to be there, that that the energy in the room doing therapy can be very, very intense, very negative, um, and you spend a lot of the session unwinding the he he said she said, um, and and sometimes it's it's you know it can take a lot of money and a lot of sessions to start unwinding and getting to the place where compassion and giving to each other and you know putting energy toward the marriage where they actually do their homework and the marriage starts to get a new tone and and feel better. The focus of this book is to really focus on the positive behaviors that can shift your marriage in a new direction, but that are positive behaviors that aren't going to take you but a few minutes every day. We considered calling them habits, but we really believe they're secrets because you can employ them easily, but love is a practice. It's not an event. You know, when we fall in love, we think, oh, this is the best feeling I've ever had. I want to have this for the rest of my life. But the truth is the honeymoon ends. We move into the everyday, the issues that happen every day, and that romance starts to wane. So, Anna, do you think that perhaps what we're truly talking about when we say marriage, we kind of needed to take a step back, just as you did in your book, you know, in the the beginning of the book. It really was take a step back and find out who you are in the first place. What do you want? What makes you tick? And what really is going on about yourself? I think sometimes people enter a marriage and they want to find the pieces of them they believe is missing versus knowing themselves. Whereas just in the beginning of the book, when Tom is asking about a job, really what he really wants to know is, what do you dream about? You know, um, what do you want to do in life without limits? And how do you enjoy your off time? So I think if those things you can really come into concept with for yourself, that's what you have to really start focusing on versus an end result of a marriage. I mean, we can work our way back, but it still is always going to come back to self, right? I was just going to say, I think that's so well said. You know, the, the, in, in the book we have, and you know this, we have this image of a tree, and we use that as, mm-hmm. as a sort of a meta, metaphor for, for a marriage. And the idea is that, that um, there's you and there's your partner, you're two individual people, and then there's the marriage, which is sort of this third thing. It's like a third being, a third person in the room almost, another right. entity. We call that a tree. And the roots of the tree, the soil of the tree, that's the two people. We are the 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 the, the soil and the source of of this third entity. And and the point we're making is, you know, improving a marriage, shifting a marriage, deepening a marriage, making a marriage okay. more fulfilled. It's not about changing the other person. It's becoming more of the person that you are really put here to be. Uh, exactly what you're saying. It, it's really about personal growth more than, you know, right. fixing the other person. <laughs> you know, it's so funny you said that because, you know, uh, there's been this tree, you know, every, I share on the radio, I live in New Orleans, and this is a tree that's been outside my door, and it started only about two or three inches out of the ground as a single trunk. And I don't know what kind of tree it is, but then it split into two. And then it kind of went off to the left and the right, one each, and then it started to come back to the middle. And they started twisting around, but not touching each other, twisting around each other. And I would always go outside and watch it as it grew over the years. And I said, oh, and I called it the hugging tree, you know, because it was gently still growing on its own, yet it was in the same encapsulated energy space, to be able to, as I call in your book, what I believe marriage is, is a co-pilot situation. You know, so it was a hugging tree. Then one day I went out and the groundskeeper had cut one of the pieces off and I went, oh, oh my gosh, 
You know, they took one of the pieces off, and, and then it just stayed as two separate entities. And I went, oh, wow. And I think always of that as a metaphor. Because in a marriage, you're really co-piloting. You aren't just stepping in and jumping each other. We think about, you know, let's think about energy beings or ghosts or spirits. You know, you walk in a room and all of a sudden you feel cold. That spirit jumped you. You know, we don't want that. You know, we want to keep ourselves separate. However, we want to be able to exist as our own entities, but be in the same energy space, but not jumping overlapping, intermeshing, where we lose sense of self because we're then engaging as a whole. Any thoughts? So true. So true. People get into a marriage and they look to the marriage to complete them. And, you know, they they let go of the place in them that is growing and changing and that brings their own unique identity to the marriage. And as well, we have a... Um, you know, we have an image in the book where two circles come together and join, and in the middle is this elliptical, and that is the actual energy of the marriage itself, what both of you bring to the marriage versus your own separate circle, which you also maintain. Sometimes people get super stuck on that, and they think that they have to overlap. In other words, he can't function without me, and I can't function without him. Then that's living a conditional life, you know. That's leading a um, attached to the hip kind of thing. And that's not what we're talking about to be able to grow, because then it's almost like you're becoming saprophytic. You, or you're almost like sucking the life out of each other to be able to exist, and that's not where we want to be. Yes? Yeah, you know, for years, um, we've been together for about 25 years, and and um, for for years, going back to the really the first few years we were, we were together, people would ask us, "What's what's your guys' secret? What are you guys doing? What do you know that I don't know?" Um, mm-hmm. And then once we've been together for a decade or for more, people started saying, "How come you guys still look like newlyweds when you're not newlyweds anymore? What's your secret sauce?" And and I mean. This book is, is in a way, our, our effort to answer that question. It's kind of our love letter mm-hmm. to the world. But I think a part of our secret sauce, if we have one, is we really honor each other's separate spaces, separate identities. We both really enjoy our time alone. And, I mean, we thrill time together. We love doing things together, cooking together, shopping together, taking walks together, um, that's that's lovely, but we also each really treasure our own personal isolated time because we each have our own lives that we that we want to continue growing, and that's so important, right. I think. I think that's so important because, you know, just as you share another story in your book, and she said about if she could untangle the knot in her stomach, and I said, ooh, hmm. she's got an attachment there. She's kind of, she's attached to the outcome or a sense of controlling, and we don't want that. We want to be able to say, I'm going to sit here in peace. I'm going to just know that the outcome will be the best for each other. And, whoa, Mm -hmm. isn't that a different conversation? (laughs) We we have this, in all the Go-Giver books, uh, we have this this principle we call the the Pindar principle, which simply says the more you give, the more you have. And it's kind of counterintuitive and it's kind of paradoxical. But the idea of it here is if you go into a marriage with a spirit of generosity, focusing on the other person, how can I make this other person's life better? Not being a sacrifice, not being a martyr, but simply right. looking at the other person and saying, I want to I make their life happier, better, Richard. That you end, you end up both growing because you're feeding the marriage itself. You know, when I just as you said that, John, and I've shared this with you the last time we talked about your book, it's almost as if the go-giver to me is I'm radiating unconditional love and those around me, you know, feel it, know it, sense it, and are in tune with it, period. Mm -hmm. You're not giving out a condition. You're not giving out a rule. You're not trying to manipulate, control, or navigate, or... Uh, drag them along with you. You're just in that way when you can 
unconditionally navigate this this love of just period, just love, not of self, of others, or whatever, just unconditional love and radiate it, isn't that what the real true gift is? It is. And the underlying principle in all the Go-Giver books is adding value, adding Mm -hmm. value to another person's life so that you actually are constantly bringing good things forward to others. And that gift, if you will, in in the Go-Giver marriage is based entirely on developmental theory. Each secret is deeply embedded in developmental theory of what it is that we needed when we were infants and young children growing up continues to be the very thing that we need as adults. And how do we give that to each other without losing ourselves? Yeah, when you you know when a baby is born, it's unconditional love. They're not asking or anything. They can't tell you. You know what I'm saying? They're just being, and they're just there. You know, let's talk for a second, Anna and John, about you know the first secret you say is appreciate, and I immediately wrote below it the I see you. Many times people will say, I don't feel appreciated. It's because they can't. They're not seen, they're not heard for some of their essence that they're trying to, uh, you know, it's sort of like you feel like you're like an octopus with your tentacles going crazy because you just can't engage with another person to feel connected. So I think the I see you, can you see someone else in their vulnerability, in their open heart, in their soul essence versus are you just looking at someone for their accolades, their legacy, their, how they're physically appearing or what they've done, or, you know, in other words, like all this other stuff that they've got as their lineage and they're to- toking it along, right? The most powerful need that we have in the world is the need to be witnessed and to, in being witnessed to be seen, listened to, heard, and understood. Mm-hmm. It's primary. Yeah, I think so. I think the question, you know, so many people uh, in the year 2022 are posting on social media, I want to know my mission, what my purpose is, you know, but in essence, they're really trying to say, I want to be loved, I want to be heard, and I want to be seen, period. And if you can just state that and stand in that power and see what appears versus trying to control it to have it as your outcome. Don't you think sometimes in marriages you end up, you say, I have this picture, and if you don't bring me the silver box with the gold bells on the front, and it has to have a little corner that's dented in, and it has to jingle when the bells ring on it, then I can't see you. (laughs) You know what I mean? And you you state these outcomes in your head, and you formulate a projection or a manifestation, and you're expecting it to appear as if. When in essence, that which what you're looking for is below that. Heard, seen, loved. You just can't get to that because you're stuck with the movie. What you're describing perfectly is codependence. It's, I will love you if you behave this way. I love you, but I love you more when you're this way or that way or when you are quiet, when we're out socially or when you are, you know, that desire to control the other person is a way of making the love conditional. And Mm -hmm. if you can move away from conditions and begin to just appreciate the other person and appreciate them in... in, (sighs) authentic ways, mm-hmm. you know, ways that really um, define something real in their life. Like you might be able to stop your partner and say, you know, when you talk to our children, my heart just fills up because I watch you. You're so kind. You're very careful. You unwind their fights. And you are always just doing beautiful things with them, building their esteem. And it just makes me so happy. You're such a wonderful father or mother but it's an authentic appreciation it's taking the time to let your partner know something that you really see about them that really makes you appreciate them you talk also about the word attend and i wrote on the bottom of that page co-pilot you know 
I think, Gav, as I've shared over the last 10 or 15 years on radio, I had said that I really truly feel that we are co-piloting in our life. In other words, um, people will say, oh, I had a bad marriage, blah, 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 and they give you all the negatives, you know. And, and then uh, I said, oh, but can you thank that person for the, being their co-pilot? Because they brought you to a place that you had experiences with them and let off all of the other story behind it and just say thank you so much because you know what you're still here today you know sometimes um a lot of times people will say at end of life they will say oh but this is blah 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 and all this other and they're unrolling all of their stories and their shame or their guilt or their pain or whatever and i said but can you still have deep forgiveness thank you for co-piloting with me because you became part of my story whether you you um, wish to judge it or whatever, or cast it out, you were still part of the story, and you walk this path with me. Don't you think that's yeah. important too? Because so many times I, people will say, "But I want a perfect marriage," but they forget that there's these spots in the middle. That that's the time when you just say, "We're both going to co-pilot this plane." Yes. And that's it. Yes, and you can't. And, and, you know, one of the things that we, we talk about in the book is, is you, you want to take responsibility for the energy that you bring to the, to the marriage, to the relationship, mm-hmm. because if you don't, you start to kind of naturally and automatically, instinctively hold the other person responsible for everything that happens in the marriage. And in your life, mm-hmm. you start to hold the other person accountable and you start to blame. It's, you know, when the two of you coexist, you, you use the word coexist in your introduction. When the mm-hmm. two of you exist in the same space, you're going to turn the flashlight of your attention on this other person. And what we're saying in the book is you have, enough, you have, a, you have a choice. You can turn the flashlight on this person with a positive point of view or with a negative point of view. You can look for what to criticize, or you can look for what to appreciate. And if you just develop the habit, like Anna said, we almost call these habits, just develop the habit of looking every day. It's like a treasure hunt. Looking for the things in that person that you go, oh, that's delightful. Oh, I love that aspect. Oh, I love this aspect. And point those out. You start to, it starts to become a habit, and you automatically start to see this person as the unwrapping of gift after gift after gift, almost like a treasure hunt. What if the idea when another person will show you something, and you will say, oh, gosh, I really wish you didn't do that, blah, 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 when in essence, isn't that showing you also something to be able to reflect upon. In other words, we always want to say, you, whatever, you know, oh, I wish you didn't, I wish you didn't take the kids out there. You knew that supper was coming, blah, 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 now they're not going to eat supper, you know? But in essence, you could say, oh, gosh, stop for a minute. I see that, perhaps, and not make excuses for the other person, because a lot of people do. Oh, well, he didn't know, blah, blah, blah. But in essence, you could say, you know what, okay, I'm going to be okay with this today. And then maybe we could just say, maybe once or twice a week, we're just going to let it fly and see what happens. Who will eat first? Will you go have a snack instead of your dinner or whatever? In other words, is it okay to be an allowance to respect the choices of each other and to be able to say we can still navigate this path we were on to honor and respect each other. Absolutely. You know, giving people the space and allowing them to, you know, have that moment where they took the kids out for ice cream right before dinner. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's really a choice. But what you're also describing was a criticism. You know, when you come to your spouse and say, why did you do that? I wish you hadn't done that. You're, you're basically criticizing them. And again, you know, you could have taken the opportunity to twist it and say, well, I guess the kids aren't going to eat their vegetables tonight, but I'm glad you guys had a good time, and thank you for being such a wonderful father. And also, too, to say, oh, I'm so excited. Can you tell me more? I think that was such the the best phrase you had in this whole book that I really picked up on was, Mm -hmm. tell me more. Isn't that what we're always saying in a relationship? Tell me more. 
well, where did you go? What did you do? Did you have a good time? And they're all bubbly and excited. And you say, ah, it must have been wonderful. And find that joy versus maybe taking something from, oh, my mother said I never could have ice cream before dinner and replaying old tapes. Yes? I'll tell you where that I'll tell you where that came from. It, it, it was, for, for listeners who haven't read the story yet, there's the first half of the book is a story. It's a parable mm-hmm. and, about these people named Tom and Tess. The second half of the book is sort of a how-to guide, how to apply the principles in the story in your own life. But in the story half, there's this line that you're talking about. Tell me more. Mm-hmm. That that uh, that Tess says to Tom. It's something that that she said to him the first night they met. And it's something that she says right at the end of the book, tell me more. And it's like a symbol of their, of their relationship. And I'll tell you where that came from is when I was first um, getting to know Anna, when we were first learning about each other and, and spending time together, I would start talking about something and feel like maybe I'm talking too much. And she would just say, tell me everything. And I was so utterly charmed by that that she would say, tell me everything. I was so completely charmed um, that she was interested in me and she wanted to know what I had to say. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in her too. I want to know what she has to say. Uh, So that's, yeah, that is, you're you're so right. That is exemplary of the kind of relationship we're talking about where you're discovering the other person. Even decades later, there's still more to discover. It's a never ending. So, Anna, can we also talk about when you say, tell me more, and you start to hear pain and suffering, um, shame and guilt, uh, struggles and challenges when you're getting to know another person, or when you're already into a marriage many years and these things start to eke out because you never said, tell me more in the beginning, and they didn't feel comfortable enough or vulnerable enough to be able to share or be open. Well, one of the things that happens to all marriages is everybody brings many, many suitcases each and in those suitcases are all your unpacked history, all your unpacked emotional wounds, and whatever it was that harmed you or hurt you as you were developing and growing up. And we bring it to the relationship, and sometimes it's, it, it's unconscious how it comes out, through codependent behaviors, through trying to control the other person, through say, saying things like, I'd be more attracted to you if you lost 20 pounds, you know, through doing hurtful things because we're trying to control the relationship instead of being in it. And mm-hmm. so I think, you know, it, it's really so important for people to be able to give each other that space to grow and, and to be compassionate when the wounds start to emerge. And sometimes if the wounds emerge, sometimes it's, it is important for them to have an outside person to talk to to sort it out. You know, I have a client who has discovered that, you know, some of the childhood abuse that he experienced is coming toward him via his wife, who's very verbally abusive. And, you know, he's in his 50s. It's later in life. And he's just beginning to wake up to the fact that this is a pattern that he was comfortable with because it's a pattern he knew from his childhood. And now it's playing in his marriage. And so that's one of the things that is significant, is that we all bring our material. I think that when somebody starts unloading their baggage and and their shame and their hurt and the, the things that have hurt them, the most important thing to do is to be compassionate, to listen, and to give them the space to express it. As long as it's being just laid out on the table, and not used as a weapon against you. Yes, absolutely. I think also, to the idea is that when you talk about attending to others, I call it um, like when your energy is co-energy of nourishing. Uh, You can't sit down and consistently water, you know, one side of that hugging tree and expect the other tree to, oh, well, they can fend for themselves or, you know, oh, they're they're always strong. They're going to be okay, so I'll take care of myself. Or the opposite, I will continue to take care of them, and then you end up being the one that's not nourished or not being cared for. So I think the idea is, is how can you do that without becoming, as we would say it, you know, a lot of people, there's a lot of tag words, 
these days, and, and we don't want to become a part of that tag word. We just wish to be open, to support, to nourish each other and self and see it as that versus giving it, oh, well, I don't get this, that, or the other, or you don't get this, that, or the other. Part of what makes uh, the, the, the relationship deepen and grow in a positive way is this kind of this balance that you have because you you do need to take care of each other and and not in a codependent right. way but but in a in in a generous way you need to be generous right. you need to be kind you need to be compassionate and it's not it's not a giving up of yourself it's not an abdication of your individuality mm-hmm. and that can happen that we've all seen that where in a marriage where one person literally lets go of their dreams empties their life and and just, you know, kind of goes through the motions of living to serve the other person, that's Mm -hmm. not a healthy thing. And it doesn't really serve either party well. So we need to, to, yes, step in our own lives, live our own lives, grow on our own path, and at the same time be compassionate for the other person. And that means, you know what that means? Sometimes I have something really important I want to say, and I need to just, like, let that go and listen. Sometimes I just need to be the listener. Sometimes Anna will be the listener. And she has something she really wants to say, but I have something that's just so critical right now that she says, okay, I'm going to postpone my need till two hours later or until tonight or until tomorrow because this is what's going on right now. That's a question of just sensitivity and, and, and knowing that, what, com- what goes around comes around. You, you're you're going to take care of each other. Everybody's going to take care mm-hmm. of the other one at some point. Yeah, it's almost having this innate sense of compassion. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Compassion, yeah. I always call it, it, sort of like compassion is a pink rose. Compassion is a gentle sun coming through like a rainbow. You know, I think of compassion that way. It's not either or. It's just, hmm. You know what I mean? It doesn't have any words or definitions. It just you just sit down and you, and you breathe in and you close your eyes. It's that single secular second of silence or peace. And when you do that, that's when you're able to really be at your best for another and for self. You know, it was so interesting just now, John, when you were saying that description. I was thinking of a luge, you know, the, the, the things that you push across the ice and someone sweeps it away in front of you. And mm-hmm. I was thinking, that's like a you know a marriage sometimes. But then you could turn around and say, oh, cool, great, we made it to the finish line. And all of a sudden, the person who was sweeping the way turns out to be the sun and melts the ice, and they go on to something mm-hmm. else. So in essence, if you could take that picture, that metaphor, and say when someone is having an issue in their life, it's not about stopping what's wrong. Like, let's say someone's really struggling. You don't want to stop it. You want to allow them to work through it, like dusting the ice away in front of the thing going across of it. Support them in their growth and how they're going through this. And then at the end, say, whoa. And then they just all of a sudden dissipate and there is no more. The ice is gone and now they're on to the next. Do you think perhaps, Anna? I think that's a great analogy. I think that, um, you know, the secrets are based in in gratitude and in giving. And, mm-hmm. you know, there's a whole body of research on gratitude and giving. It affects every cell in your body. It improves your heart. It decreases right. depression. I mean, when we are giving to another in such a compassionate way that you describe, this is the essence of what real love is. It's really leaving the other person the space to heal, the space to be, and the space to be creative and to grow. Um, What about the idea of belief and the beliefs? Uh, There's a lot of controversy out there. There's been quite a bit of talk back and forth about what is my truth, what is my belief, what is my core values. And people are getting kind of confused because a lot of that's coming up for examination now. Do I truly believe that I need to work in a cubicle nine to five 
because that will define my profession and I will get up the ladder or whatever. Do I need to believe that my kids don't have to eat vegetables at every single meal seven days a week? Do I need to believe that my husband will always show up every night and sleep in our bed? What about the idea of believe, beliefs, and all of these outcomes? You know, in relation to marriage, in relation to, and, and by the way, not even marriage specifically only, but, but in relation to, to a, any deep, long-lasting relationship you have with another, even if you're not technically married. And this could even apply to good friends or to, to mm-hmm. parent and child or to siblings or to, so in, 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 a, in, a long, in a deep, long-lasting relationship, when we talk about believing and about belief, it's, we're talking about having an unshakable belief in the other person at their core. And this can coexist with acknowledging that there's flaws. And that may, you know, that your spouse or your partner may do something that bothers you or may do something that wasn't smart. Or there may be, you know, there may be problems that arise. But what, we, what we're advocating is find that mm-hmm. part in you that believes in that person no matter what, even in the middle of issues that happen or, or friction or problems, even in the middle of that, there's still there's this so that the there's this core that's like oak roots, oak tree roots going down to the center of the earth, so mm-hmm. that the other person never has to worry, never has to wonder. Uh, we're having a rough time right now. I wonder if she still loves me. No, 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 no. That's not an issue. That's mm-hmm. never an issue. One thing that, that that I know about Anna, and I only know this because it, we've established it over time, is that no matter what happens to us, she believes in me. She believes in my right. core. It's kind of like the way a parent feels about a baby. That baby can spit up on you. They can make a mess. They can cry. They can have a tantrum. They can be they can be misbehaved. You may not love it. But you adore them, and nothing will right. ever change that. You know, in closing, I think the idea of the shared on the radio so many times is that our soul essence is like a ball of glitter inside of us. This human body is our vehicle. It's something that we have stepped into and we carry around as a tool to navigate. Uh, the things we do in life, our hurts, our jobs, our work, our our names, our identities, and our egos are like badges that are attached to that wetsuit. When in essence, truly, what you're talking about, John and Anna, is about being able to say, are we navigating from our badges, touching, feeling, emotions, triggered? Um, are we just reacting to the outside space so that we can, you know, just stay out here in this fluffy world? Or are we in the cracks of the wetsuit and we're always struggling, we're feeling like we're you know, ebbing and flowing back and forth but not really getting the point? Or can we get to the point where the unconditional love is soul essence? So what you're really talking about, John, is that belief is the belief in the core essence of the soul. That's where you're navigating from. You're not navigating from all of the other stuff. You're saying, I have a belief in the soul energy, and that's which I'm just connected to, and there isn't any other words about it. Sometimes when someone asks you about someone when you're in that unconditional space, you say there really aren't truly any words. It's just a sense of energy. It's just you just go and you go, again, close your eyes and be in silence. That's when you're connected. You know, we are in our 60s. And when we met, we were in our early 40s. And we have pictures of us when we were that age. And we're like, who are those kids? (laughs) Because we've aged. And we're aging aging now. And, And, you know, we have friends and neighbors and people around us who are in their 60s and in their 70s and in their 80s who have bought this story that they're getting old. And they've, and they're kind of attached to that external. Right. And it, it baffles us because mm-hmm. we see each other aging, and it's like I look at Anna and I see the, the, the 11-year-old, the 8-year-old, the 6-year-old mm-hmm. that's alive in her. And right. I, think that, um, I think that we're going to be seeing that, in, that child in each other, you know, till the day we shuffle. 
because right. that's exactly what you're saying. That is our essence. That's the soul. That's mm-hmm. what you fall in love with. And so you fall mm-hmm. in love with everything that goes with it, regardless of the okay. age, regardless of the condition. I think that um, in closing, I think that my my thoughts on on the book and, and it being our love letter, if you will, to the world, um, but at the same time that it's, it's a practical guide for how to how one person, and this is the difference between therapy between two people versus one person taking on the five secrets and using them in their relationship to change the tone of their relationship completely. And it's that simple. I mean, it can be just daily actions that will change the tone and change the feeling because they're based on giving they're based on gratitude, and they're based on bringing the love that does come from that very essence that you were just describing. Yeah, I think in the year 2022, we're saying, ah, you know what, let's sit down and let's just erase the chalkboard and say, I'd like to start again, and then start to feel into each other and explore that way. Because, you know, no longer are we willing to sit in traffic for two hours each day going to work and sit in a cubicle, you know. We've now decided um, we can have our groceries delivered to us. We now decided that we can ask for help. We now have decided that love is something different. Um, caring for another person may be something totally different than we thought before. And what are the gifts of the heart and the soul? versus that which we thought before was the way in which we were navigating our world. Do you think? I think absolutely. And I think it's interesting. In times of crisis, and you know, clearly we've been, we've been living in a crisis the last two years, in times of crisis, people really do tend to go inside and look at what's, what's important, mm-hmm. what's true, right. what's real, what's essential. And I think that's what we're, that's what we're talking about doing with, with yeah. one another. Absolutely. Well, guys, it was it was such a great time to have you with us today because I think so many times people are saying, well, the old way didn't work and there's been a lot of divorces and walking away. And there's others who are saying, I think I'll give it a try and I don't know. So your book, The Go-Giver Marriage, is truly about being able to say just this is an exploration. What you're really doing is you're casting out a net and you're saying, oh, these are all options. These are all potential ways in which you can navigate. These are all things that are possibilities. And when you have possibilities, it truly is an exploration that will really be a, great, a really great day for everyone because you say, ooh, that didn't feel so good. I'm ready for the next thing, yes? And I, I'll just add to that that we've both been married before. This is not our first rodeo. <laughs> so, you know, yes, for, for all who have been disappointed in love, for all who have, have quote, failed, I'll put that in quotes, at love, for all who mm-hmm. have been in relationships that, you know, that have passed away and, and have left them feeling like they, mm, that didn't work, the person is there, the relationship is there. Um, our experience is, the, you know, it's, it's, there is, there is a, a golden sun there over the horizon. Well, guys, it was such a pleasure to have you with us. Can you share with us how to find out more information about the works and uh, your website and information? Absolutely. Our website is www.gogivermarriage.com. And all the, you know, people who endorse the book and all the information about the book, um, how to pre-order the book. And also we have a number of... um, master classes that we're going to offer to people who pre-order as well as a zoom um, meeting with all of us together about two weeks after the book launches that um, people who pre-order will all be invited to Um, so there's a number of free gifts and um, we're excited to hear from people how they feel about the book what secret is their favorite and sort of what kind of impact it's had on the marriage Very good. Well, I thank you so much, John and Anna, for joining us today and sharing how we're able to navigate, you know, and to be able to say, ah, I don't want to do it that old way. I'm looking for something new, and this is definitely something new. So we thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you'd like to find out more information about John David Mann and Anna Gabriel Mann, please do check out the link on the bottom of today's show page to go directly to their website to find out about the Go Giver Marriage, a little story about the five oops, a little story about 
the five secrets to lasting love. Please do click on it and uh, check out all of their works. There's a lot of information there, how to also navigate your own path. You, you don't have to sit in the old ways and keep trying to do the same old thing all the time. You know, I think if if there's something new that comes along, be free, be open, um, and say, I have no idea. But, wow, stepping into that unknown is definitely a time where you can play you can explore, and you can grow and expand. So please do check it out. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Dr. Jeanette Gallagher. Until tomorrow, have a great day. Today we discuss many life-changing concepts. Who do you turn to, and how do you know what is best when faced with a health crisis? Dr. Jeanette is a patient advocate. She listens to the patient, the doctors, and the family, clarifies the health issues and concerns, then helps the patient make the best choices going forward. If you would like help implementing change into your life and health, we can talk and see where you are stuck and how to improve the quality of your life. Check the link on the bottom of today's show page or visit drjeanettegallagher.com to schedule a phone appointment today.